I'm John Parker. I started Yeti Bicycles. Unfortunately, I ended up incarcerated for a good part of my youth, and I took a vocational class and got myself certified as a welder. I landed up working in the motion picture business as a welder fabricator in the special effects department. Probably would have done that the rest of my life if I hadn't uh, flipped a race car down in Phoenix, Arizona, and ended up being full trauma for three days. I got a job working for a guy, Scott Breedhoff, who made the uh, SE racing bikes, the PK Ripper, the Quad Angle, the Flovo Flyer. Also, that's where I met uh, Bicycle Bob Wilson, the originator of the Sweetheart Cycles, the Cruiser Bikes, also the Moto Cruisers. Uh, an unsung hero that deserves a lot of credit. He was a true pioneer of mountain biking. I had a 1928 Indian motorcycle that I sold at the time and I bought Bob out. I bought his welding machine, I bought his fixture, a couple of other things. We need a new name and we need to go a different direction. And I had bought a real good down sleeping bag from a guy in Topanga Canyon and the name of those sleeping bags was Yeti. I asked him what I uh, owed him for the name and he told me a t-shirt. I discovered my partners, Chris Herding and Frank Waddleton. The company was Yeti, you know, it wasn't Richie, it wasn't Fisher, it wasn't Cunningham. You know, this was good to build a team that we would collectively uh, design bikes and make bikes and do stuff. John Parker's my name, and here at Yeti, building fast mountain bikes is our game. There's the nine lives of Yeti, you know. How many times did we almost run it into the ground when we had it? Schwinn almost ran it into the ground. The ski company couldn't get their arms around it. You know, God bless uh, Chris Conroy, you know. He got it. He understood the philosophy. He knew, he knew the meaning of it. He, he had witnessed the history of it. I really admire what the Yeti guys have done to keep the tribe thing going, to keep the friendly, good time company uh, appeal. Uh, 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 it abounds to this day. Between Jody Weisel, who was uh, the editor of Mountain Bike Action, and myself, and, and um, the guys at Yeti, I mean, it's just, it, there's so many things were changing back then in terms of like what the potential design of what a mountain bike could be or should be. Um, there was a whole SoCal, NorCal conflict of like under the chain stay breaks, blah, 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 you know? And um, honestly, I think that it was like just uh, Jody's, Jody and John Parker, and they just, we realized with Yeti Cycles as a local frame shop, they had a penchant for doing things, a penchant for wanting to do things differently and trying to do things differently versus just like double diamond, following some obscure, you know, obscure rule about what road bikes used to be in 1973 or whatever else, you know? So, especially back then, late 80s, early 90s, I mean, it was like mountain bike technology was like sky's the limit, you know? And so this was just kind of like, came out of that, you know, one night of, I think, you know, again, Jody thinking about a way to get, because it was just about wheel clearance and mud clearance and everything, like all these different issues were coming, already coming to the fore at an early stage. I hadn't any experience with elevated bikes before I had, uh, you know, some Mexican food with Zap and Jody. That was the first time. I didn't know what uh, Richard Cunningham was up to. I didn't, I didn't have a clue about this stuff. And Jody was, uh, Jody's a very deep thinker, innovative, tinkering kind of guy. And uh, we ended up clearing the dishes out of the way and he started drawing on the placemat, this elevated stay bike and that, John, if you want to do an article with us, go back to your shop and build this bike. And so we went and built the bike and they test rode it and they raved about it. And then uh, like a tidal wave, the phone started ringing and the, the buzz, you know, and the humming in the pits and when are we gonna make this bike? I went back and sat down with Chris and Frank and, and we discussed this thing and uh, could we make it and could we bend the tubes and could we do this? And then uh, the tube, uh, between the down tube and the uh, chain stays. That thing was just a two-fisted monkey fuck to make. It was one of the most difficult. We, we ended up calling it the love tube because you either loved it or you hated it. You hated it if you were the guy making it. That was made from uh, Jody's cocktail napkin drawing. You know, I, I took the placemat with me. Uh, we went home and built it. I think they were the ones that gave it, you know, that this was the ultimate bike or something was, was what the article, so we, inherited or borrowed or gleeped uh, the name 
and uh, put our uh, our spin on it. And uh, there's the Yeti Ultimate. This has the Yeti tail section on it that we're known for. You know, we fell into uh, the turquoise and, and uh, just ran with it. It's kind of a nice color, you know, it works okay. Unfortunately, as you can see, the day glow thing came in and uh, we incorporated some of that. We had made deals with Answer Products, who was manufacturing our forks. Frank had made a deal to manufacture his stems. I mean, the stuff that the guys were doing at, at, with Answer, the AccuTrack fork, the stem, the Hyperlight handle, the Hyperlight handlebar, honestly, was like the biggest thing, like to me, when I had this thing, you just beat the shit out of you with this fork, right? The Hyperlight handlebar, you just think it's like a straight, handle, flat handlebar. That thing was so brilliant. I mean, it was like suspension. The difference was so night and day between all just the chrome molly bars that preceded it, you know? So guys like Texera, those guys at Easton, I mean, it was, you know, it started to get closer to Ultimate when you started combining all these different components. And then, you know, Shimano would help. But I mean, I just, I just remember when we first got the taper light and then the Hyperlite handlebar, that was a huge difference back then. I mean, it, incremental, but it was huge. So, I mean, the, and the fork was just rad. I mean, you could just stick the thing in a, you know, it just, there was no flex, right? You know, again, these little, first the spindly little chromoly pinner forks, you know, that thing was just about bam, out, in and out, you know? Um, the tires were coming along too. Those guys at Ons were doing different tires. You know, the Panorama Smoke was my favorite tire in the whole world. And so I raced this at the Mammoth Kamikaze one year, and it's just on the on the Smoke tires, it was just bitching. I mean, at Mammoth, just you know, gada gada gada, you know. But it was great because it's just like again sturdy, you know. I like the style of it, but I also love the function of it. It it, it is pretty much a, a big BMX bike with gears. It was a good challenge for us. And it made us, you know, try harder. And what it also confirmed is I, I'm surrounded with some really talented guys. You know, this is 1989, 1990. This was a, a very nice bike for the time. Uh, I thought it was pretty innovative. Ultimate relies or resides in the mind of so subjective, right? Like the ultimate pinup girl. Is it Farrah Fawcett or is it, you know, somebody else, right? Um, No, it wasn't the ultimate. It's a good name at the time though, huh? Uh, no. Also, the three of us had an inherent hunger and love for racing. Julie, Miles, Missy, Jimmy Deaton, all those guys uh, rode our stock geometry bikes. I got a phone call from Belgium, and it was a young uh, Johnny Tomac calling me from Belgium. Hey dude, I need a bike to race. I was like, Johnny T, I'll meet you in Park City in a week and I'll have a bike ready for you. Tomac, you know, was 18 years old. I went over to his brother-in-law's house, got one of his mongooses out of the garage, copied the geometry, incorporated what I could, had him a Yeti, was at the Norba National in Park City. And here I got John Tomac racing for Yeti on a handshake deal. Uh, I didn't even know who Julie Furtado was, but I was getting these phone calls from this girl from Boulder, Colorado, and I'm like, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether to say yes, I don't know whether to say no. She's hungry, she wants to race, she wants somebody to give her a chance. We sealed the deal. Again, another handshake deal. I didn't have much of a budget at that point. Julie Furtado, pound for pound, is the most, she's the ultimate mountain bike racer I ever met. Charlie Litsky, who was John Tomac's agent at the time, he calls me from New Jersey and says, I got this wild child from Vermont and I'm gonna loan her some gas money and send her to the worlds in Durango. John, you better have a bike for her. Her name's Missy Giovi. John Parker is like a total character. So it was kind of inevitable that we'd meet. Sean Parker like put me on it and said, well, let me see what you can do, kid. And um, I don't know what I did or like where I did it right there, but I, I think I basically like hiked straight up the ski hill and like went <laughs> fucking weeds up to my waist and just started bolting down. And he was like, okay, that's enough. Here, here's a jersey. And um, you know, I won the worlds for him there. <laughs> so it kind of started with like my first race was I won the world championships for the guy. When I started losing the Julie Hurtados and the John Tomax, I would get up early. I would be out there for amateur uh, rounds. I, I would be along the snow fence at seven, eight in the morning. I went to watch Joe Lawwell race up in uh, Northern California one time. And there's this guy in uh, cutoff Levi's, a tie-dyed t-shirt, and he's 
backing it in hard, like, you know, the guys that ride the 750 Harleys, you know, on the half miles. This guy was so stylish and just flicking the bike in there. I know I was there to watch Joe, but uh, that's the day I discovered Miles Rockwell. Yeah! I was like, Miles, you know, I can work with you. When you build bicycles, when you're a frame builder, the, the truth is, you know, it's for the rest of your life. I will always love bicycles. I will always love motorcycles. I'll always love racing. But what I didn't love was coming back after all these years to see the same antiquated business plan with the bike companies. I like change and I, I, I like being the upstart. I like being outside the box. Yeti had an edge, it had an outlaw image to it. We were kind of the subversives of the time. We, we were the ones demanding change, you know, doing different things. And, and that hasn't changed in me. So now I'm back. My latest creation is a uh, plus size uh, hardtail. This is a handmade bike by uh, Frank Waddleton, FTW. There is no better welder in the industry than Frank. I've made a lot of my fame and stuff with race bikes. Uh, this is not a race bike. It, it incorporates a lot of what I learned about building race bikes, but I, I'm trying to make fun trail bikes now. As Americans, we're overworked, we're underpaid, we got gridlock on the freeways, we got neighbors' dogs barking, we got all this shit to contend with. What we need is quality recreation time. And I want to build bikes that give people that fun factor that they can get out on the trail, or on a bike path, on the beach, in the snow, and enjoy that fun factor and that, that that good, that good feeling that bicycling brings you. So that's kind of my goal and, and, and where I'm going. <laughs>